tonight we have Doug Fine. Um, Doug was a world-class adventure writer and investigative journalist, writing culturally insightful and funny dispatches as he traveled the world, going to the nooks where the world's then-moneyed media venues weren't sending their people. After realizing that living in sync with his ecosystem was where his own inspiration and personal happiness resided, he began writing books about his experiences. Fine now travels around the world speaking about sustain his sustainability realizations and his drug policy work. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming to the Boulder Bookstore, Doug Fine. Thank you, Audra, and it's a pleasure to be back here. This is the third time um, at this just remarkable room. It feels like you have to bring your A game and perform <laughs> at the Boulder Bookstore. And this is a Boulder topic. This is, uh, this is for you guys because hemp is happening, it's for real in Colorado. I mean, bless you for Amendment 64. B bless you for including hemp in it. Bless you for Colorado's superseding federal law and allowing commercial cultivation of hemp this year. Um, and I have to say this, this is the third of four Colorado events before I head out to the East Coast and West Coast to really bring the gospel to people that are probably not as well informed yet, at the moment, just wait, wait. Um, as you guys are today, although I won't assume anything, and I'll, I'll start from step one, but for my Colorado events, I have to thank um, the people that are really doing it. The uh, metaphor that came to mind the other day was I spoke after some of the people that are bringing the industry into the ground, and some of them are here today, like Jason Love, and um, I just... I feel like Howard Cosell reporting on boxing after, <laughs> after like George Foreman and Muhammad Ali have spoken. Like, uh, um, while the moment hemp is legal federally, I will be cultivating hemp for reasons that I'll, I'm about to tell you. Um, nonetheless, these are the people making it happen. In Jason's case, it was, and he's sitting there in the back row, um, dark blazer, in glasses. Um, in Jason's case. Um, a lot of different ways, but most prominently, on very short notice, called into a non-liberal Colorado legislator's uh, office on no notice after hanging out with him. Um, he can tell the whole story so another time, but and, and told, yeah, let's write some hemp legislation and made it happen. So blessings to you on behalf of humanity for that. So I'm going around the world now telling his and a lot of other people's stories. Another great American hero that I have to thank here is Ryan, Ryan Laughlin. Um, um, anybody here, uh, I'm just curious, does anybody here not know about Ryan Laughlin? I'm just curious, show of hands. Okay, so Ryan Laughlin is um, a farmer from a conservative part of our state, basically, uh, I'd say our state, I'm from nearby New Mexico. Let me just stop for one second before I really launch into this and say, I hope it's okay for the filming that I'm moving around a lot. Oh, yeah. Okay, cool. Thank you. Um, I tend to wander. And you guys can hear me okay in the back? All right, okay, great. Thank you. So, Ryan's story. Um, Springfield, essentially Kansas, but with Colorado license plates. Um, and he knew it was time. His neighbors were struggling. Um, GMO, climate change, uh, you know, terrible drought, it's a dust bowl out there. And um, he brought it back, putting his family's federally subsidized ranch at risk last year um, when in February, uh, DE agents, and are there DE agents here today, show of hands? <laughs> <laughs> um, welcome if you're here. What the Canadians have done is put their Royal Canadian Mounted, Canadian Mounted Police drug squads as part of the industry, inspecting hemp fields. Incidentally, not that you, not that any, you know, thinking human being would ever question this, but do you know how many cases there are of mistaking industrial cannabis for psychoactive cannabis mm -hmm. in Canada's 15-year-old and nearly $1 billion history? Any, any guesses? Yeah, no. It's not an issue. If you're, if you're unfamiliar with the, with the but botany of the industrial cannabis plant, the, there's a couple of major reasons why they can never be confused, but the main one is psychoactive cannabis is a prima donna. It's, a, it's manicured and it's just loved for every moment of its life. Um, and I'm a big fan, for those of you who know too how to film my previous book, of outdoor cultivation. I'm a sustainability guy. I drive on vegetable oil. This, by the way, is a hemp shirt made by my girlfriend. 
And I realize I'm about three side notes into Ryan Laughlin's story now, but I, I will tie it, tie it in. Um, this is like after five interviews today. I can't complain that hemp has this much interest because I really think it's going to be good for my family and humanity. My kids will be wandering in here in a little while, I'm sure, but um, they're down in the, in the kids' reading room with my sweetheart. But I learned a new quality of hemp today, which was when a five-year-old spills like Vietnamese um, spicy chutney stuff all over you. Um, hemp, it really, it's amazing. I just wiped it off. It's like DuPont's sustain master without the top. <laughs> it's an, I'm not kidding. I didn't know that. So back to Ryan. Um, planted with the help of Dr. Bronner's, we'll talk a little bit about that uh, soap company and their activism, but planted uh, 50 acres, putting his family's federal uh, um, farm at risk, and had a, had a harvest last year. You probably, I think Jason, you were there for the harvest, weren't you? Yeah, Tom and I were there. So, oh, and Tom was there as well. Tom, another hemp hero here. And um, so, um, there's so many things I could tell you about Ryan, but one day there's going to be a statue of him because not only was he risking DEA um, raids, trying to create a tax revenue, tax generating economy for all of all Coloradans, but also um, bring, you know, small farmers back to the land in his community that he cares about. He's got young kids also. Um, but the second thing he was doing was building the seed stock back up. The very beginning of Hempbound, I talk about. Um, David, Dr. David West, who in the late Clinton administration was able to get a research permit for a half acre of fenced alarmed study in Hawaii. And it was actually valuable. To his surprise, after several years, he discovered that this Chinese cultivar works best in Hawaii, and now Hawaii is just, just now passing their hemp legislation. And for those who don't know, we're all, the hemp's back on the table. The federal, the farm bill this February, a great day in human history. Um, reauthorize hemp cultivation. So, um, only for university study for now, but that's fine because what David West discovered, he went to the seed repository in Virginia and asked around, and it was like Raiders of the Lost Ark in like the back of the warehouse of the warehouse of the warehouse. And finally, you know, there's a joke in Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy that the public records for the demolition plans for Arthur Dent's house were like in a disused bathroom guarded by a leopard with no electricity or something like that, <laughs> he found open baggies of rotted seed. That was the pride and joy of the world economy of this valuable plant we're going to be talking about. Um, and so it's gone. So it's up to people like Ryan to rebuild it. And then there's a secondary issue, which is you could say, let's let Darwin decide. There's the ditch weed that our federal dollars have been unsuccessfully spent trying to eradicate for the last 77 years. There, here's what the hemp experts, especially in Canada, which has this mature, fast-growing market for hemp that we eat in our health shakes and all that. What they say is, listen, this is the uniformity era. This is the hairnet era. You need to be growing uniform cultivars, as the strains for industrial cannabis are, are known. And if you, unless you're planning on just pressing your own backyard oil or maybe chopping down the fiber and making a, a local con, uh, hempcrete uh, mix, which is, by the way, cheaper, much earth-friendlier and uh, uh, more and efficient than pink insulation. We'll get to that a little bit later on. For those kind of applications, selling oil at your farmer's market, making your own little body care products from the flowers, sure. You might be able to use ditchweed in Nebraska, and I'd love to be, be, be buying Nebraska ditchweed brand body lotion. That's fantastic. But really, you've got to kind of get with the program and develop our, redevelop our cultivars, because frankly, I don't, you know, one day there will be a McHemp burger in McDonald's, and they're not going to just be buying it from backyard people. It's going to be big time agriculture, for better or for worse, and I think mostly for better, but it's something we'll be discussing. Um, so, this was uh, hemp's biggest year in the last several thousand. It, a lot, the Farm Bill was really the, the culmination uh, here in Colorado. On Colorado Day, a hemp flag went up uh, above the State House um, on August 1st. So I had no idea this was going to happen. At, what happened was as I was researching to Ida Fail and being a sustainability guy, I, I realized that whatever your version of the hemp plant, the, the cellulose, the stalk, is just basically getting wasted. The Canadians burn it in the field. They're growing 20% acreage per year. Nobody's doing anything in the new world with the fiber. And what really mattered to me was local sources and, as we'll talk about, energy. But I had no idea that the Farm Bill was finally, hemp was going to be taken seriously. Thank you, another Coloradan, Jared Polis, your congressman, for making this happen. 
it's a miracle. Can you believe this is really happening? This, this kind of issue was tossed out of committee with a laugh as of two years ago. And I swear I did not bribe anybody in the White House or Congress to be part of the marketing team for my book. It's like, I feel honestly even weird making that joke because it's so not about an author and his book. It's about what this plant is going to bring to our species. As a father at climate change mitigation, I'm really psyched. Anyway, so I didn't know this was going to happen. This, is, this was my uh, plan, second paragraph of the book. The plan, my plan the day becomes hemp legal is to begin cultivating 10 acres. I, I have 40 down there. I'm a solar powered goat rancher in New Mexico. Um, my plan is to go begin cultivating 10 acres of the plant so that my sweetheart no longer has to import from China the materials she already uses to make the shirts I wear in media interviews and at live events to discuss the fairly massive economic value of hemp. In a cynical age, we can use one less irony. So thank you, Congress, for doing the right thing. I'm a patriot again all of a sudden. Um, so this is one of the key concepts I hope to leave everybody here with today, uh, especially if someone is considering being a farmer or a, uh, a processor or an investor. Try cropping. Here's the deal. You have a factory about the size of this room, and this is from touring around the world and seeing, and seeing this in action. In Manitoba, the biggest processor, Hemp Oil Canada, undergoing their fourth expansion in 10 years. They've been in it since day one, 1998. Their processing room for every drop of hemp oil that comes out of that province, practically. There's another great one called Manitoba Foods, which is also uh, a, a farmer cooperative. But anyway, for a lot of oil, it's not much bigger than this room. That's the biggest in Canada, right? And they're expanding, granted. My point is, if you and other farmers in the Boulder area, wherever, in your region, and an event I did last night in Colorado Springs, a woman and her family came all the way up from the San Luis Valley to find out about hemp and try and get something like this go, going in their community that's struggling, like so many farming communities. Anyway, in this one room, this size, a hemp seed oil press, which is where the money is today, is not a complicated thing. Press, it's a metal press, I've never seen one. It smushes the seeds, it, it's not high tech. Juice comes out of the bottom, the oil, mega rich oil comes out of the bottom, and the hemp seed, oil, seed cake that's left is also fantastic and protein rich, great for animal feed, often used in body care products and, and, and health food and stuff like that. Um, that farmers today in Canada are making profiting $300 per acre on compared to in the right net realm of 30 to 50 on GMO corn and other products like that. So it's immediate. As soon as you get going here in Colorado, if you form a local processor, there is a market for this. It's growing. Like I think the Indian market, I just read a study, is growing 24% per year. So there's money right away. Thank God, right? Because in this society, everything has to be bottom line first. Like it's nice saving here, it's all good, but they have to be making money. So that's one, I say try cropping. So there's three things to do with every crop. The second thing is fiber. The Canadians today burn it in the field. They do nothing with their fiber um, for the most part. So when I asked Sean Crew, the, the owner of uh, Hemp Seed Oil Canada, why that is, and he said, gas is too cheap. Because in Europe, in Austria and Germany, entire communities are becoming energy independent by throwing their farm waste in this, these gasification generators. They're small. They're the army's buying them up. They're the size of like a big outhouse. And basically it's a fairly carbon friendly anaerobic combustion chamber that produces um, energy that you can sell back into the grid, make your community independent, make your ranch independent. You can Google on, on YouTube, let's say, uh, uh, Austrian gasification farmer generator. And you'll see this guy, it's subtitled in English, walking around, stuffing it in, describing it, it's fantastic. And then look up the story of Feldheim, Germany, too. They, uh, they're completely, they went from 30% unemployment to no unemployment in a poor part of Bavaria by this type of technology and other types of green technology based on farm waste. So that's two types of crop, crop. And the third thing in the same factory about the size of the room is something right from the start with fiber. Now, I don't want to oversell this because the fact is your roommate with the lava lamp was right about the hemp. It's, it's that good, but I, I like to throw in any possible caveats that I can so that I don't sound like that guy, right? Um, clad in hemp, right? Yeah. Um, so the third thing with fiber is that if you're doing high-end fiber applications, textiles being one, there's a, a knowledge base. You have to know how to, especially upon harvest, know what you're doing. Also, we'll talk more about this a little bit later on. I looked at, uh, I, I went in the Netherlands to the factory that where the fiber uh, is uh, processed for BMW and Mercedes door panels today, and that's, there's no peace signs about that. That is about 
inexpensive, reliable, strong material. Um, as petrochemicals and petroplastics and all those <coughs> nonsense start to get too expensive and, and uh, we realize that they're too earth degrading, right? Those type of apps, uh, nanotechnology, body armor, um, 3D printers, all the plasticky kind of stuff, there's, some, there's, there's knowledge around that. But from season one, Coloradans, you can be, like I said, hacking up that fiber and using it for construction. We'll get into that. There's a lot of things you, you can be doing from season one um, with the fiber. Um, but this kind of gasification stuff right there, that's, that's it. That's what I'm really psyched about. Um, I think a bolder audience gets this, but are people here familiar with Jared Diamond's book, Collapse, just out of curiosity? So it's an it's a interesting, if scary, book about uh, a bunch of other societies in history that have been analogous to our deal. Um, very successful trading over huge areas. One of the, one of the areas <coughs> they give is between your home and my home at the Chaco Canyon in the Four Corners area. Those Anasazi folks were massively powerful with a huge city and they were trading from Seattle to Costa Rica. Talk about globalization. And they pretty much collapsed overnight. This is the Khmer culture um, near in modern day Cambodia, Angkor Wat. Seriously, powerful people for hundreds of years in Southeast Asia. So, so see if any of this sounds familiar, right? Um, you know, deforesting your hillsides, which causes deg degradation of your water <coughs> supply. Uh, Oversprawling development seems to be a, a consistent problem. Um, you, you get the idea, right? So will we make the decision in time? Hemp is making me a lot more um, optimistic about it, and the energy side of it is really what it's all about. Um, I did take here in Denver with a terrific hempster and engineer named Bill Althaus. I did take a hemp-powered limo ride with him. He owns a limo that used to be owned by Imelda Marcos and, and Ferdinand Marcos, the uh, Philippine dictators. And, um, oh boy, it was a really cush morning. Um, in more ways than one, he, he was also... Um, <laughs> I'm trying to keep so dignified up, but Chelsea Green, my publisher's official publication date for this book is 420. Um, <laughs> it's a good plan. <laughs> so um, anyway, Bill gave me a ride around in, in this limo, um, and uh, what we were doing, what he was doing that day, I was writing a column um, about that he was delivering these uh, Harlequin strains of high CBD cannabis to veterans with PTSD and uh, showing them how to clone them. And he was, so we drove from his house near Lakewood down to, uh, down to Colorado Springs to deliver to this veteran. who was just so appreciative. On hemp oil, it was so awesome. Um, but it's a similar issue now. Biodiesel, we don't have a huge amount of diesel saturation in the US, although I drive on vegetable oil in my diesel rig, my ridiculously oversized American truck, for anyone who's right for a only Subaru. Um, so um, really, yeah, sure. Hemp at the gas pump through diesel or, or ethanol, that's great. Um, biomass per acre blows corn and soy away, but I still think it's going to come from our processors, and so do like these Republicans in Kentucky, ready to get it going with their utilities, um, planting on coal and tobacco damaged monoculture land with hemp. They are ready to go. Mitch McConnell, this is not an Occupy issue. This is this is cross aisle, um, you know. It sounds a little trite, but the reggae star is called the Cannabis Plant, The Healing of the Nation. But you've got Mitch McConnell talking to Pat Leahy about, and Jared Polis, you know, talking to Rand Paul. It's a, it's a pretty amazing thing because it's good for our country and it's good for, for humanity. Um, okay, so energy, that's tri cropping number one. The fiber stuff, that's the, uh, it's silky soft. That's the stuff that goes into, uh, into the uh, BMW panels, uh, BMW door panels that I got right out of the conveyor belt. It was really amazing. And while we're going on, maybe we could ask some rhetoricals, like why is hemp in Mercedes door panels? You think it's political? Um, why would China's president visit a hemp processor? Hint, 30% of the world's pesticides come from cotton, non-organic cotton. And China's land is saturated with poison, and they know it, and they need to heal it. Phytoremediation, um, it heals, not only does it heal mono, hemp's long tap roots help heal monoculture damaged soil from a, a number of methods, um, but it, it also takes toxins from the soil, as actually a lot of plants do, but hemp is so good in marginal lands. Um, examples are that it was used in Chernobyl as soil remediation from radioactive soil after, uh, after uh, Chernobyl, and um, it's not been implemented yet, but it's in the mix and discussions for Fukushima as well. Um, the other reason is just simply having an annual plant that has long taproots creates aeration. 
it's really important at a Xeriscape conference, unrelated to hemp, I was giving a talk just about giving up petroleum at a Xeriscape conference after Phil Oman Subaru came out, and I, I another speaker which just blew my mind showing like this cross section of soil that he actually like brought in, kind of like an ant farm, and what long tap roots do to the soil, how vital it is from microflora through creating habitat for earthworm, whatever it is, you know, and it, it's important stuff. Um, so, why did the Kentucky hemp seed germplasm pe perish? For those who don't know, I, I don't like to really dwell on it, this 77 year aberration when humans in the, in the New World have not been cultivating hemp. Um, but essentially it was a typo. Um, many of you here will already know the story, but briefly, when the Marijuana Tax Act was passed in 1937 against the wishes of the American Medical Association, hemp was, all versions of the cannabis plant were thrown in. And quickly, already, the drug war was exporting jobs offshore. The U.S. started getting the 40 tons of Navy hemp rigging, rope rigging, that it needed for every vessel. And by the way, the parachute string, the, the cord that saved George Bush Sr.'s life in World War II, um, the Japanese captured the Philippine source. So all of a sudden, the U.S. Department of Agriculture makes this propaganda film that sounds like your roommate with the lava lamp. Seriously, look at it on YouTube, Hemp for Victory. It's unbelievable. It tells the absolute truth. You'd think that, you'd think that it was made by someone wearing a tie-dye, but it was the government begging farmers um, to cultivate hemp. So how does, that, how does that seed stock perish? Obviously, it shouldn't, and thank God we're, we're going to be uh, rebuilding it. And this is where the money is today. If you've got a cousin that kind of has a couple of thousand acres in, in eastern Colorado somewhere, um, you want to talk to them about getting hold of seeds that have, uh, that are for seed, that are cultivars, varieties that are for seed. Um, a really popular one in Canada is called Finola. It started in Finland. You can go to provincial Canadian sites to find out what might work well here in Colorado. Um, Ryan Mothlin himself at his Rocky, I think he's called Rocky Mountain Hemp Company. He's, I think, going to be a seed provider. And also um, another guy I know of is Ben Holmes at Centennial Seeds. And there may be others as well. Um, or you might want to take your chances at, at here I am being taped, uh, advocating um, superseding federal law here. Hopefully it'll catch up. Stay within Colorado if you want to obey federal law, but what Ryan Laughlin had to do last year was import seeds from friends all over the world, and some got through and some got seized. And um, thank God um, he was allowed to harvest. Um, a couple of things on this har uh, planting a thousand or two, acre, two acres. In this really revealing interview with Sean Crew, who's doing it, the mogul there with Hemp Oil Canada, that I had with him in a very sub-zero moment until the afternoon, um, drinking hemp coffee. Well, all around him, there's like workers expanding the, 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 the factory. Um, I said, hey, you know, I live on 40 acres, so if I want to like, in a checkerboard pattern, turn 20 acres at a time over to hemp and start cultivating, what do you reckon? He goes, bah, 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 talk to the hand, 20, dude, this isn't a hobby sport. You want to play this game, and he's, this, this is Manitoba mentality, North Dakota mentality, and frankly, probably Eastern Colorado mentality. If you're less than a thousand acres, you're a hobby farm. And I, I, I did a little basic math on this. Farmers are clearing, three, clearing profit, $300 per acre on hemp in Canada today. No guarantee of future profits. I'm not an investment advisor here. But if you're talking a thousand acres at 300 an acre, that is more than I have cumulatively made from book sales in my career by, by quite a stretch. Um, so go for it. But I don't think it's the only way to do it. Other people reminded me about this in the course of my interview. A, a guy who was the hemp seed oil provider for the U.S. in the 90s uh, wrote about a little bit of hemp found. And he said, don't listen to the moguls saying it's going to all be hemp. Um, frankly, I'm fine with both ways as long as there's G we institute the GMO ban on hemp that Canada has prophylactically. I'm fine with big hemp farms. But on two or three acres on what this plant provides in seed oil, I could be with a little press like that from providing my family and maybe a few other neighbors hemp oil needs for daily shakes um, and the residue, great animal feed. One uh, hempster that, that some guys here will know, Andrea, Herm, Herm, Andrea Herman, a great hempster and hemp consultant in Canada um, for a long time now, who by the way is a Missourian who is going to see her home state, her Ozark state, uh, show me state, re-legalize hemp soon but had to move to Canada because she was so mad that this important crop, historic crop in Missouri, wasn't allowed to grow there. And she's getting dual citizenship. The Canadians love her. They have her respecting the crops and everything like that. She's also a pig farmer. And all she feeds them in the cold wind Canadian winter is that, that seed cake that's left over from the press plus some compost. 
it's that good. And one of her pigs was like pregnant and um, healthy and looking great when I saw them. So don't think you can only grow a thousand acres. I'd start, I'd start with whatever you got and use it in rotation with other crops as a soil, uh, soil restorative. So not a hamster. Iranian postdoc Farhud Delajani, University of Manitoba. Shh, those wires and stuff are temperature readings, energy readings, and all that jazz. And there's the hempcrete. We'll talk about what that is. Um, right next to the pink insulation. And hempcrete's beating it. It is better than the petroleum toxic nonsense that have been in our Home Depot type stuff stores forever. It's cheaper, better, no downside. Um, and easy to use, okay? So the deal is, you take those hemp fibers chopped up in your first year's harvest, mix it with lime, turn it up in a, in a mixer, and I saw this in process in a home that was actually being built, um, and it becomes, it's this very easy to handle, light, fluffy, airy dealio. And when you speak to the actual guys in the hard hat doing the actual work, they'll tell you, like, this is by way of trying to not be the lava lamp guy, they'll say, yeah, you know, we had to spend a couple of days, or maybe it was a couple of hours, um, experimenting with the ratio of lime to fiber before we got it exactly right. And it takes two or three days to set and you get this beautiful insulation that's easy to work with, attractive, you can paint right over it. Um, and varieties that you can experiment with that are load bearing as well, um, as well as soundproof. So this is a North Carolina house and there are those who told me they believe the first killer app in, in the US market is gonna be construction for that reason. Because chop up your hemp crop, mix it with some lime, put it in a bag and sell it at the Home Depot. <laughs> you know, it's over, I'm oversimplifying here, but it's gonna happen. Oh, and by the way, um, it's carbon negative. The, the lime in the hempcrete mix extracts carbon from the air and uh, hardens as it grows too. So theoretically, it's, these houses are gonna last for hundreds of years. Um, I'd like to time travel as a journalist to make sure that that's true. You know, I want to go 100 years ahead and make sure that that house is still there. Okay, so instead of raiding and spending taxpayer money to get rid of hemp, uh, the Canadian's government and industry have co-sponsored an organization, uh, 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 a research facility called the Composites Innovation Center. And I, it was like, you remember in the early James Bond movies touring this place where Bond would be walking through the facility with Q and there'd be like a guy being sprayed with a frame flamethrower, but he didn't suffer no damage because of their experimental suit. And he'd like throw a grenade at a car and it wouldn't even dent it. And that was just like incidental ambient stuff as they're walking through the factory. That's what this was like, except it was all with hemp. And um, hemp body armor, hemp soundproofing. Um, these guys, look, not hippies, okay? These are <laughs> scientists who get paid either way. And they're like, Doug, it's the real deal. It's the real deal. This is a, an, an entire car body made from hemp fiber. I kicked it, bashed it, did everything I could to dent it. It's lighter, so it's going to be more fuel efficient and stronger than petroplastic. I forgot to mention about the on-site savings and construction. I didn't know this, but concrete has to be heated to some ridiculous. I don't know if it's 3,000 degrees, whatever it is on-site. Huge amount of heat for traditional building, whereas not the case with hempcrete. So you're already saving energy on-site. And I asked, there's a company called British Lime Technology, and by the way, they already sell bags of hempcrete in the US under their subsidiary American Lime Technology, if you're looking to, to, to buy packaged today. Um, so I asked their honchos, is it a no-brainer? Is it like hemp wins every time? And they said, and they do commercial facilities, housing developments, as well as a big Marks, Marks and Spencer British department store, like one of these like two block long franchise type stores in the suburb of London, out of hempcrete. And uh, I said, is it a no-brainer? And what the reply was from Ian Pritchett, their director, was it's an absolute no-brainer if you are the person responsible for operating the facility that you're, being, that you're building because the energy savings is so astounding that there's no, that it's a no-brainer. But if you're just like um, flipping a strip mall, you're trying to like throw something up as cheap as possible. Probably today it's marginally cheaper to go and buy poison press board and drywall mixed with God knows what at Lowe's. Um, marginally cheaper. Once we have domestic sources of fiber, hemp fiber, it won't even be a question on that front, but 
Once again, any time I can not sound like the lava lamp guy. <laughs> this was a really cool thing. This is something I'd love to see. So a farmer in Canada, I visited him in the field. His name is Grant Dick. And uh, he grows hemp on, I forgot how many acres, several hundred acres, not to process the hemp oil uh, for the open market, but because his wife had a dream of starting a hemp-based energy bar company. And she went with her prototype from their own harvest and won what they call the Manitoba food fight. You know, the judges thought it was the best thing and gave her $20,000 to like jump. Do you think we have bureaucratic hoops, those, those Canadians, um, with food products, you know? Got all the wheels turning so that she's an approved company and um, I, it was great. I flew back from this research back into the U.S. and the U.S. Customs, the, uh, the, the border guy said, you know, anything you're importing, any, uh, any bringing in anything from Canada today, any food, livestock, drugs? And I said, uh, I don't know, drugs, like hemp is my shirt, my pants, um, <laughs> this like 400 energy bars that this lady gave me, and um, also my lunch um, has hemp seed oil on it. Let me think, anything else, you know. Um, but other than that, no. And they were like, okay, cool, welcome, welcome to the US. Um, so there's a lot of little cool niche things that you can do. And this is sort of the dichotomy. Ryan Laughlin, his family has been in, for generations in farming for the money. Like, they care about the earth in their community, but this is not like charity. They're doing it to make a living. So he's got $600,000 invested in air seeders, really big technology. So that's one way to do it. And I encourage it because it's good for the soil. But niche stuff is fantastic too. Bond with your community, get together, community-based factory. Fiber processing, seed processing, energy, all in one factory. Please, do it. Um, so the issue is, how do we rebuild, how do we find the right cultivars for our ecosystem? For anyone who might be watching this video later or who here tonight is not from Colorado, thank you all, by the way, for coming out on a beautiful evening. Um, this was a Belgian hemp farm, obviously, just after harvest here and uh, I visited last, last November. Um, but um, essentially what you're doing is you're looking for regions that still cultivate hemp and still have their, their hemp germplasm intact that have similar elevation, um, rainfall, um, but most important, phyto period. That's why it was so surprising in China. They found this Chinese cultivar from a fairly different climate, worked best in China, A, because it was not eaten by the birds and bugs as much for whatever reason as other cultivars that Dave West, the researcher, tried, but also um, the phyto period in the region was the same. They basically were getting similar amounts of daylight. Um, so spin the globe and find out there's a ton of good consultants um, listed at the back of Hempbound um, that, can, that can help you with this stuff. Um, and also experiment. You know, the farm bill says you can experiment. One point I, I really want to make I don't think this is going to be a problem for a long time. I was only mad about this for two or three days, but I was so mad about it that I'm going to do my last bit of venting. In Windsor at the Northern Colorado Hemp Expo a couple of days ago, Ryan Laughlin comes up to me and says, I said, what's new? What should I be talking about about your scene this year? He goes, the fact that the feds are allowing us to do this and cultivate as long as we're associated with university research. Guess where I have to go to get my university research you know, and he was, he's a modest guy, but you know, me, Ryan Laughlin, the guy doing starting it. Like, guess where I have to go? And I was like, uh, uh, I don't know, uh, Webster College, University of Phoenix. And I can't remember the name of the Cannabis College in Denver. And I don't mean to denigrate Cannabis College, okay? But the revitalization of the hemp industry, Colorado State University, CU, should be jumping on this. This is our future. Are you kidding me? Ignoring it? That is not okay. That is not okay. So I ranted about this at, at um, Colorado. And what Ryan told me is all you need is one affiliated accredited person at a university to write a note on university letterhead saying, I am working with Ryan Laughlin. He's a university affiliated hemp farmer. And then you're, you're good to go with university research according to federal law. Now, hopefully we'll pass some of the other new hemp legislation that will allow commercial cultivation nationwide. It will be a non-issue. I'm okay with these couple of years of experimentation and rebuilding the seed stock. Canada did that too before they started their commercial industry. I'm fine with that, but my goodness, get on board. So I was ranting about this at Colorado State and about six professors afterward were like, oh, sorry, we didn't know, we're cool. Who do we call? It's good. So if anybody 
remembers this at another time and here's a farmer with that problem, just hit the contact button on my website and I can put that farmer in touch with someone, at least at uh, University of Colorado, Colorado Springs. But for folks here that have contacts in the academia here in town, let's get on the ball here. It's a joke. Washington State University sent out a memo the day after Fe the farm bill was passed saying, great news for America. Hemp's back in the mix. You know, that's Eastern Wild. That's not, you know, that's not Olympia. Okay, that's not Evergreen. <laughs> I love Evergreen, actually. Yeah. Um, so, thanks for dealing with my rep. This is no joke here. This is supposed to be a wheat field. This is the, this is the amber waves of grain, people, in Eastern Colorado. North of, uh, not very far, one county north of Ryan in, in Eastern Colorado in Lamar. I met uh, Jelaine and Bill. These terrific people. And uh, they're desperate. They thought hemp was marijuana. They had no idea about any of this stuff two years ago. And now they're getting ready to jump on the hemp bandwagon. Because look what they're eating. Their crop looks like. This is not 1932 Dust Bowl. This is outside their front window 2012. And, like, I don't think I need to make the point about climate change, but it affects my life as well. Also, I want to, oh, and I'll show you in the next slide how it affects my life. Um, and it affects your lives here with your devastating Colorado floods last year and fires, same deal we're dealing with in New Mexico. And then this is sort of my, anytime you get past petroleum for any reason, you're doing a good thing for humanity slide. This happens to be the Niger Delta. You hear about Exxon Valdez, you hear about BP. This is a just like terrible ethnic conflict being spawned in the Niger Delta over oil and corruption and just stuff that should not be happening, of course. And I'm not a guy who, um, I was going to say, I don't think Cheney should be jailed. I'm, a, I'm okay in certain conditions for the Cheneys to be pardoned. I think he should be jailed. They should be jailed. <laughs> I, I, I'm willing to not only pardon the Roves and the Cheneys and the Rumsfelds, but I'm willing to put, like, what do they call it, a gusher statue there on the mall along with the Lincoln Memorial, and I'll tell you why. I would not be here today talking to you guys if it weren't for this plastic stuff that comes from petroleum. We would not have been able to win World War II, a real war for freedom, um, were it not for Texas crude, you know. Um, petroleum was last century's thing. Thank you, petroleum. You did a great job for us. We appreciate it. Retire. You're retired. Goodbye. Thank you. Like with segregation and other 20th century stuff. See you later. Um, so, I, you know, I just am kind of like trying to avoid the anger and jail the Cheney thing, you know. I won't be in the streets with signs saying pardon Cheney, but um, I will not <laughs> protest a compromise bill whereby every American farmer is subsidized, as Europeans are, for every acre of hemp they grow in exchange for immunity from prosecution for, for Dick Cheney. I think that's a good fair trade. I, I want to say I'm not, I was not like the college hempster guy. Really. I remember I worked at Sierra Magazine as like a low level, right after college editorial assistant type thing, where there was paper conferences where all the paper companies came in to try to talk about how to make magazines more planet friendly. And I remember going around the table and everybody having their ideas. And I said, print on hemp paper, 1993. And, uh, and I remember like these Cascade, you know, Louisiana Pacific type people um, looking at me like, Okay, <laughs> next idea. Um, so, you know, I, I, it was in my consciousness at the time, but I was not a, really a banner waver about hemp. A Betsy Ross hemp made banner waver, um, by the way. Um, draft of the Declaration of Independence, you know about that one? Uh, Virginia colonists paying their taxes in hemp, you know about that one? Uh, but Thomas Jefferson and George Washington both, were, of course, were cultivators. And uh, we'll talk a little bit more about it later when I get to my pet favorite pet application of clothing. But uh, the Japanese emperor's coronation, he's draped in, in hemp, symbolized continuity and health and high quality and all that good stuff. Um, Dutch barristers and, and uh, justices at The Hague until very recently in this very silky kind of hemp. Uh, but we'll talk more about that in a minute. My point being, hemp is one in the marketplace with my family. It started when I had kids. Um, the, in brutal New Mexico line drying, if you have kids and you use cloth diapers, you know it's poop, wash, line dry, poop, wash, line dry, poop, wash, line dry, poop, wash, line dry, poop, wash. Sometimes that's just Thursday. And um, <laughs> cotton, even organic cotton started to come apart. Hemp held up. 
Um, my sweetheart needing good prenatal food, hemp seed oil, still goes into our shake every morning. Um, you know, it's in sync with my, my solar kind of powered lifestyle. And then how about this one? University of Manitoba study I visited, hemp fed chickens versus corn fed chickens transfer markedly, I have a video of this, of the, just even the color of the yolks, but just based on nutritional studies, markedly more nutrition in terms of omegas and certain types of minerals and vitamins into the eggs uh, compared to the hemp-fed chickens compared to corn-fed chickens. So it's passed on to us when it's hemp-fed livestock. Um, where else can I, I want to press my farm's own uh, seed oil. I want to feed the cake to my goats who are really eager for it. This goat, when I took this, this selfie with my goat, Taylor Swift, um, took a bite out of the book shortly after. And then climate change is affecting me too. I know that Coloradans are used to this with the, with the terrible flood you had last year, but this was like Noah had 40 days and 40 nights that he couldn't cross, you know, get find land. And my, the stream that I have to cross to get from my ranch to town, to civilization, it was like 43 days where you couldn't get across and one of my neighbors tried. That wasn't me, thank God. Although I feel bad for him. So this climate mitigation stuff matters. Um, construction um, and wood composites uh, cumulatively provide like a really super high in the 20 plus percent range of carbon emissions worldwide. So get petroleum out of that, out of construction, out of industry basically, then we're really in business. Um, so we talked about the Japanese, and this is sort of hemp in history. First Levi's, this was the hemp museum in, uh, in Amsterdam. And in the clothing industry, softness is referred to as hand. So when you go to a mall, the, if you go to a buy or see a non-organic made in Bangladesh poisoning some river uh, cotton shirt, it's going to be super soft. It has nice hand. Um, and this, this shirt has pretty nice hand um, as well. And so the Chinese are way ahead on this. So I'm hoping for some cultural exchanges and trade missions. I made a joke in, in Hemp Island that if your dream is to, to revitalize, get those American clothes, clothing factories in South Carolina back open again with hemp, you've got a little bit of an uphill battle because the Chinese are way ahead. You might want to get a job at one of the Chinese processing factories as a, as a janitor and do some industrial espionage. But I got an email from a hemp clothing guy in California who said, dude, they invited me in. They gave me a tour. And you don't need like the espionage joke. So I, I, I don't know if I'll change it in future editions because a good joke's a good joke. But um, <laughs> yeah, call up your local Chinese hemp processor and, and figure out how to do it. Um, a Stanford-led team found about two weeks ago, you can Google this, in Anatolia, Turkey, they dug up a tomb where an entire family was buried together in basically perfectly preserved hemp clothing. It's, it's a great material. Um, and as I said earlier, it gets up Vietnamese food. Um, and another one of my girlfriend's hemp shirts, not the one I'm wearing tonight, I'm pretty sure that two weeks ago I was testifying at the high session of the UN's drugs, Narcotics Drugs Conference, which is leading up to the 2016 meeting, which is gonna hopefully end the international drug war. It's, Let's uh, stay abreast of that. Um, but anyway, so they were holding preliminary meetings in Vienna, the UN headquarters there, and the UN uh, drug headquarters there. And so I got invited by a nonprofit to, to testify about this as a journalist. And I think, I'm pretty sure, that I'm the first person to testify at the UN completely clad head to toe in hemp um, in modern times. So that, was really fun. that was really fun. Um, let's see. I'm a little bit embarrassed that the hemp twine that I use today to hold the tomatoes up in the garden come from, again, wins out in the marketplace. It's just the best twine. Um, comes from Romanian made, Romanian grown hemp that I bought at Walmart. But on the other hand, I'm psyched that Walmart sells hemp. So, you know, I'm hoping it's, it's a little bit win-win. Mm -hmm. This is the deal here. We support the industry that we want to support with our dollars. And we're starting from square one. We need to make sure Colorado and US hemp is GMO free from day one. Um, and this is not to endorse any one company, okay? I just want to talk about the way Dr. Bronner's soaps does. Another 
product that went out in the marketplace. I could safely use it on my kids. No sodium lauryl sulfate. Um, it's, it's fantastic. The only ingredient that the grandson of the founder, David, here, changed in hemp, in, in, in Dr. Bronner's soap, was he removed caramel coloring and added hemp and sued the DEA to allow him to, to keep importing hemp along with another, a lot of other companies as well. Last year, $54 million company, fast growing company. This dude is a CEO of a company. He decided to lock himself in a cage in front of the White House <laughs> to demand that hemp farmers be allowed to cultivate hemp. Guess what? They listen. It works. Like this is a brand here and it's righteousness and it's beyond Google's admirable don't be evil slogan. It's time for the actively be good era. And hemp is going to be at the forefront of that. This is our brand with hemp. And we should really stick with it. He, uh, the company, Dr. Runners, not only is really psyched to sponsor, as they're already doing, U.S. grown hemp, but their olive oil comes from groves uh, cultivated jointly by Israelis and Palestinians. Mm -hmm. um, they're, everything's fair traded. David makes five times more than his lowest paid employee. Um, it's not that difficult to do things right. You know, you don't have to be, I was going to name name a uh, investment bank that uh, all of us may know, but I'm going to even give them a chance to come around and start uh, investing in hemp. Um, this is the U.S. Agriculture Secretary, Colorado hemp farmer and activist, Michael Bowman, um, pending our, our Interior Secretary, sorry, Salazar, uh, in Washington, where everybody's on board with this thing. Um, I could talk a little bit. Of, those who know Two Out of Fail know that the reason I chose Mendocino County to study the, the uh, sustainable cannabis industry, psychoactive cannabis industry, is because they were the first county by popular vote to eliminate genetically modified foods. Their sheriff has raided Roundup Ready corn crops. Wow. It's an amazing thing. Um, so um, it was a very progressive county that was very culturally ready for sustainable cannabis to come above ground. It's sheriff supported and everything. It's like. My, my sense from living there for a year and following a, one cannabis flower from farm to patient was that if it were any more progressive, it would be clothing optional in the supermarket. <laughs> you know? And it probably really, probably would be clothing op. Like, I don't think anybody would have a problem with it. It certainly is cannabis friendly in the farmer's market, I'll tell you that. Um, although the feds did raid a goat, uh, raw goat cheese farmer while I was in Mendocino. Can you believe that? Feds, not the sheriff. The feds, not the sheriff. Yeah. No, no. Sheriff's. Sheriff Tom Allman, Mendocino County, California, an American hero. Check it out. Too hot to fail. It's a great thing. Um, okay, so not the lava lamp slide. For those who came in a little bit late, I'm trying whenever possible to not sound like your roommate with the lava lamp about him because your roommate with the lava lamp was right about him. Um, Redding. Just that curiosity. How many people are familiar with the concept of Redding? It is still a relatively medieval process and it's the post-harvest softening of the very outer bark of the hemp plant. Um, it's a fungal process. Those guys at the Composite Innovation Center that are doing the hemp tractors and the load-bearing walls and everything, they're also studying the microbiology of, of redding. And the issue is you have to, after harvest, um, keep the plant in bundles, rotating it so that it gets just the right amount, this is for fiber apps, not seed apps, just the right amount of uh, um, moisture, not too much, not too little, to allow this fungal battle to happen that eats away at the, and you can get up the, at the fibers that you need. I'll tell you, when I went to talk to Hempflax, that's the company, the big 20 year old uh, Dutch company that does all the Mercedes fiber, um, <coughs> they don't even let the farmers do their own harvest. Their contract farmers, they are out there with them saying, no, 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 three more days. Like, it is such a touch and go thing for these high end applications. So, we do need advancements for high end fiber applications. They're, they're out there. They're called decorticators, and they're machines that will strip the green bark off. And um, we're, I, let me just put it this way I think that we're going to have uh, exciting hemp processing news coming out of Colorado very, very soon. There's, uh, there's stuff along these lines that I know is happening that I, I can't speak about publicly yet because um, the people involved aren't ready to announce it, but we're getting there on these processing and, and decorticating technologies, but reading is an issue that we do, um, we, that we do really uh, have to tackle. And because I have learned that you have to remind people of things three or more times before they really hear them, I stuck this in again. Don't forget, gasification facility in first generation f factories processors, whatever you do here in Colorado, 
do the energy production at the same time. You may have to fight some battles with, with, uh, with utilities, but do it. Let's, let's get off of fossil fuels and coal for, for our energies. There's a Betsy Ross flag and there's a 2014, Jason was there, uh, flag over the Colorado State House made out of hemp. It also flew over the U.S. Capitol on July 4th, the same flag. Not U.S. grown hemp. Yet, but it was assembled in the U.S. here in Denver. Denver. Um, so, predictions are free. So, this is what I'm going to tell, say about hemp. And by the way, this photo, I forgot the name of the guy, but he was a USDA researcher. And this is the land that today is the Pentagon. He was doing USDA research for American hemp farmers, like the Canadians are doing and like we should be doing at Sea Boulder and Colorado State yesterday. Um, which which uh, cultivars work best and which which regions and all that good stuff. Um, and there were brand name US cultivars that were renowned the world over. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention about hemp flax, not only are they personally supervising the fiber harvest, but they're jerry-rigging, they're, they're the pros, right? And as I was leaving their factory, I see sparks flying from, from one corner and you're bang, 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 and guys with the masks and you know the torches. And so I went to say, hey, what was going on over there? And the deal is, Giant harvesters lined up in their factory. There's a new market for hemp and for them, which is the flowers, using it either for medicinal or for body care and beauty care products, right? So they have now seed harvest, flower harvest, um, different kinds of fiber harvest, and they were jerry-rigging their harvesters, the most established hemp fiber company in Europe, at least, if not the world, um, for this year's harvest, based on what the conditions were. So. Lest you think it's too easy, you're going to have to uh, engage the American ingenuity as you get going on the hemp industry to really make it work as you adjust with new applications, especially on the fiber side. I don't want to say the seed side is a no-brainer, but really, if you grow canola, it's this small hemp plant, doesn't grow tall, that is just incredibly seed dense. And if you grow it well, harvest it at the right time, not too early, not too soon, and get it into a storage facility with the right amount of moisture content, um, you are probably going to be able to have a, a marketable product. Um, in other words, if you're a professional farmer who knows how to do other kinds of crops, you'll be able to figure out hemp seed. But fiber is going to really take, take a lot. Um, so here's my prediction. I think that industrial cannabis is going to be bigger than psychoactive cannabis. And my shorthand for that is Coors is big, but ExxonMobil is bigger. If you have hundreds of thousands of acres being cultivated in North Dakota, Colorado, California, Kentucky, Missouri, Wisconsin, Illinois, I'm just naming, not kind of Colorado, traditional hemp states, because Colorado actually was not. Um, and thanks to Linda Parker, Michael Bowman, and others besides Jason, Eric Hunter, who were involved in making this happen in Colorado, because it does not have a, that historical red, white, and blue kind of thing. By the way, I was approached at an event, though, in Windsor the other day by a deaf a man who told me that um, this is the sign for hemp and Invented. There's not an American Sign Language sign for him. Jason's got it. Two H's with I love you. This is it. <laughs> That's it. So just in case you're wondering, you ever need to communicate in a room um, with him. So I think that, that energy is going to be a bigger app even than, than psychoactive cannabis and medicinal cannabis. And I do think there will be a McGemp, uh, a McKemp sandwich, and I'm fine with that as long as it's GMO free. Um, it's, a lot, it's a ninth inning. Um, climate mitigation opportunity for humanity. And it's got me excited as a father. It really is that important and that good if we, if we start this industry in the right way. And we can. We can do it any way we want. Look, this is not an Occupy guy. This is Mitch McConnell, Republican. Um, Ryan Grimm of the Huffington Post did some great reporting on why McConnell suddenly came to hemp. And so I'm relying on Ryan's reporting on this, which I, as a journalist, I normally don't like to do. You normally want to do your own legwork, but he's a good reporter. And um, what he said was, Rand Paul, the junior senator, promised not to run a Tea Party opponent in a primary against McConnell if McConnell made him happen in the Senate. So McConnell was make, can make anything happen in the Senate. And it happened. Fantastic. We have a lot of thanks to give Earl Blumenauer to the Oregon, Oregonian. Uh, now I mentioned, I, I include my ranch entrance sign here because we're all kind of Western ranchers here. And I've always thought no trespassing is kind of an unfriendly Thing to have on your ranch. So I try, I don't know if you can see this in the back, but it says, welcome, pre-announcing your arrival, helps avoid accidental gunfire and or unexpected nudity, um, beware of goats. And I mention this because uh, 
I'm one of you, and I uh, I sympathize with the needs of the of the Western farmer and rancher. I should say no one's ever listened to this. No one's ever called me up and said, "Hey, Doug, I saw your sign. Thought I'd give a call. Is this a good time?" What invariably happens? I'm not like this dedicated nudist or anything, but you think if you live on 41 acres in the wilderness, you know, middle of nowhere in New Mexico, that you could get, walk out in the morning off the porch and get your boxes off the laundry line, <coughs> but invariably that's when Mary, the UPS driver, is coming down <laughs> the black driveway, you know what I mean? It's like she has binos up there, like, yep, <laughs> Doug's naked again. Let's go embarrassing. But, so, you've got my kind of progressive look on this, and then this was in Byers, Colorado, uh, what is it, like 70 miles, not that far from here, um, on the 4th of July when Michael Bolden uh, planted some ceremonial hemp uh, seeds at the 4th of July festival in Byers. It could not have been a, this was like a Reagan, there was a car show, these were, America was these people's team, I mean, it's all of our team, but I mean, this was like big hats with red, white, and blue, and um, I couldn't find a farmer there that was opposed to the idea of making $300 profit per acre. Like, there was <laughs> no issue with hemp there. This is just a bumper sticker there. It's okay to be right. Like, these are people that think Obama was born in Libya or whatever, you know? <laughs> um, so I hope I've kind of covered, like, what can we do if you're a farmer? Plant, a, plant seed oil first, but think about fiber applications. If you're a processor or a farmer, work with other farmers to collectively get your... your oil processing going on, buy the oil presses, it's not that hard to do, there are consultants available if you need professionals. For investors, support that kind of community-based type approach, so that it isn't all just gonna be monster companies controlling hemp, and as consumers, let's look you know, to the regional and local market um, for our hemp oil and our hemp clothes and as, as the industry develops. Um, I am here to support you, that's that's what I'm gonna be doing here for like the next year, if not 50 years, um, going all over talking about hemp. So you just shoot me from the contact button on my website, dougfine.com, or follow me on Twitter, shoot your stuff out, what you're doing with hemp, and I will, as Peter Tosh says, advertise it. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess to what I'd like to leave you with before we take a few questions is, uh, oh gosh, have I gotten way over my time, um, is, uh, <laughs> The whole issue of hemp being some sort of uh, exclusively tree-hugging left-wing kind of thing. I, I, I'm a patriot here for a strong America and, and a safe, strong humanity that's a planet-wide issue, healthy climate for my, for my children and for the future. So I'm just here to, if anybody has a lingering, like, I don't know what the word would be, but a bashfulness about embracing hemp and mixed company. Um, we have these wonderful neighbors who run this great local board bakery right near our, their, their Mennonites, and I, and they said, oh, you're going on, they're watching our goats, while they're good friends of ours. you're going on a book tour, what's your new one about? Oh, it's, it's about hemp, here, let me give you a copy, and they said, oh, fantastic, I don't know anything about drugs. Um, so, <laughs> there are still people who don't know, and I consider that really my job. While we have the heroes who are getting it going here, my job is going out and talking to grannies in Newark, New Jersey, and, and, and Little Rock, Arkansas, and saying, this is happening in Colorado. Let's make it happen everywhere. And it's red, white, and blue. God bless America. Thanks a lot for coming out. Few questions here before we get to the setting? Yes. Yeah, I um, am always uh, um, leery of Monsanto getting its hand and everything. And I'm wondering how it's going to happen here. So the question is, how, um, is, is are we going to get Frankenhemp, basically? Yeah. Um, so Canada has pro prophylactically banned GMOs, um, and that's fantastic. We need to need to get on that. I don't know. Are there, Jason, are there any plans in Colorado, do you know, to be dealing with GMO? Not yet. Yeah, GMO bans. Yeah, on. there are none. So far, I haven't heard anybody bring that up. And I don't really think that that would be an issue. But we'll see how it plays out. We definitely need to run a bill or an amendment to the current I'd like to see it happen. I know the federal level. Federal level. Real quick, but Laura from the Ag Department actually kind of said that there's a hands-off kind of view on GMO in Colorado. Oh, really? As, as uh, you know, the residents of the, of the state that encourage you to get involved in that issue. So I know it's a big way to that. And so there's a lot of, there, so what, what's the best website for people to find out your information on what, all the exciting projects you're doing, including her construction and other things? Oh, probably uh, teamhemp.com or hempcleans.com. 
we've got a whole bunch of projects, building, uh, infrastructure, as well as legislative work with other states. Seeds, mother. He knows his stuff. So, <laughs> um, and, for, and also proceeds, uh, did, did I mention earlier, uh, already Ben Holmes and Centennial, I don't think I mentioned that, right? And so what were those websites again? Say the website. There's, there's Team Hemp and Hemp Clean. It's kind of like cleaning your bathroom, if you will. So I'll give you, if I could, Doug, if you don't mind, no, no. I'll give you a little context on Hemp Cleans. The first bill that I wrote, um, and I love your references along the way to Occupy, but the first bill I wrote was um, basically from an invitation from Representative Wes McKinley. I met him on the lawn of the State House when I had my tent set up for Occupy, and he set up his teepee. We had a great conversation about fighter remediation. So the first bill really was about cleaning the soil, water, and air. I was very familiar with Chernobyl, uh, as well as other projects that have actually taken place around the world. And my big interest, of course, is cleaning our planet up from this disaster that's left with uh, petro foods and petro uh, chemicals and petro pharmaceuticals and so on and so forth. I hope I use that too. <laughs> but um, so fundamentally, the phytoremediation aspect of this is critical. And I'm really happy to point out the position of our universities. We really need to get them engaged. So, yes. Amen to that. So, and to, and to wrap up just quickly, I know we're going over, right? So we'll wrap up here with maybe one or two quickly. Quick, but on the Monsanto issue, um, we need to, the Canadians knew something by banning GMOs before it existed. And um, North Dakota originally, they were talking about putting in a glow-in-the-dark gene that would make hemp glow so it could be confused with marijuana. And that completely got, thankfully, you know, that's off-brand. But we need to be on it, and I would like to see, see, it, see it happen. Um, on the Colorado level, but also on the, on the federal level. But here's another issue. Not so much big ag taking it over, because I think Wall Street does what Wall Street does, and I'd, be, I'd love to drive through North Dakota and see that GMO corn replaced with, <laughs> replaced with thousands of acres of hemp as well as small. I'll personally try to support small processors, but here's the issue. In Canada, John Rulak, the founder of Nutiva, uh, a hemp seed oil company that I spent thousands of dollars on, uh, <laughs> for my own jigs, uh, told me this. Most hemp farmers in Canada today use it as a rotational crop on GMO um, fields. So you're, unless you buy organic hemp, you're buying hemp that was soaked in, in glyphosate and the other nonsense poisons. So um, search and support organic hemp. I, we're going over time, so one or quick, two quick questions. Yes. Um, in 2010, I saw a documentary called um, The Union, oh, yeah. which uh, posited that Hemp was uh, demonized by really through legislation brought about or as lobbies brought about by was, um, DuPont. When DuPont had made a chemical that could be used to make wood pulp into paper. And so is that true? And also, do we see lobbyists coming out against hemp in the future? Or is this here to stay? Great question. So the conspiracy theories on hemp, there's no smoking gun um, on, on it. There's no documented meaning there. I do, I'm envisioning a wood paneled club in Manhattan somewhere with brandies and cigars, you know. <laughs> Run off a word if I may. <laughs> so, you know, from, from DuPont. Listen, I've got these, this newfangled stuff happening. I'm starting my cotton and my, my cousin's timber for the paper. And yeah, we can't have this hemp. Um, I don't think so. The, the reefer madness stuff, even. Um, there's a lot of political history to it. It started in the Southwest. All the nonsense that, that Harry Anzinger started doing in the Bureau of Narcotics had a model that started in Arizona, El, El Paso, Texas, with demonizing Latino political influence. Mm -hmm. But, and then was transformed to black jazz singers going after your blonde child, daughters kind of thing. Um, but really, it's just, for Hearst, it's what sells papers. And that's true today. When Bowman did his, Michael Bowman did his ceremonial July 4th thing, there was an ABC Denver station there driving a long way for five minutes of this footage. And when I said, wow, do you guys recognize, you know, because I'm there writing a book, it's been a lonely story, like meeting each, you know, all these people. And um, so the producer said, I said, do you just see the importance of having like, Now, anything to do with marijuana gets good ratings. So I think it was probably a combination of all those factors. Um, and then as far as lobbying against it, no, it's at the Berlin Wall is down on all cannabis. The American public opinion is so in favor of ending the war on cannabis in general, psychoactive and industrial, um, that when, when the DEA blessed them, look, 
I'm a supporter of law enforcement. They're, people are well-intentioned, trying to do their job for the most part. But you know, the DEA is going and spewing BS in a congressional committee about people can't tell the difference between psychoactive and industrial cannabis. The committees, both parties, Congress people are like, yeah, this is political translation. Yeah, you're full of shit. Anyway, so next <laughs> question, next issue. Um, it's all that that nonsense is over. Yes, the back. Uh, just mentioning real scientific hemp oil legal in all 50 states and foreign countries. Um, the current batch is being farmed in the uh, uh, UK and Ireland and it's selling for $25,000 a kilo. Wow. So it's $25 a gram and the kilo price is $25,000. There's no THC, no flowers, just from the stems and stalks. Wow. So if anybody's growing hemp in Colorado, that's by far the most profitable thing you could possibly grow. Immediate profit, industrial hemp medicine. No THC. Awesome. Last question I saw one up here. No? All right, cool. Thank you all so much for coming out.